Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us um, on the home stretch of your Dreamforce experience. Uh, I think uh, less than 24 hours to go. So hopefully we'll entertain you and show you uh, some new features that we're coming out with around platform events and how you can help to build a connected system with Heroku. Before we get started, I have to show you the obligatory safe harbor. I'm sure you guys have seen it. You should think there's another one floating around somewhere out there. But what we are showing you today is a beta feature. It is not generally available in the system. If you are making any public or purchasing decisions, please do not base them on what we're showing you. Only base them on what is generally available. My name is Jay Hurst. I'm a product manager here with our App Cloud. I own our enterprise messaging system. And with me is Lawrence McAlpin, one of the principal engineers designing the platform event system. So what we're here to talk about is events and messaging in our App Cloud. Now, when I say App Cloud, I'm talking both the Force.com side and the Heroku side, and how we can really marry those together and allow events to stream in and out of both sides. So raise your hand if you guys have used a streaming API, outbound messagings, or Apex callouts before. OK. If you haven't, don't worry. You're still in the right spot. Um, how many of you have de a desire to react to changes within, within Salesforce in your external systems? All right, great. How many of you need a reliable, durable flow of data in and out of Salesforce? Everybody, great. So we're all in the right spot. We all have a, a huge challenge. And this is a challenge that we've actually heard from our customers quite a bit. At the end of the day, when you're connecting multiple enterprise systems together, it becomes very complex very quickly. Uh, if you have one or two systems, it's easy to link them together. You add a third, a fourth, a fifth, and it becomes really a spaghetti mess. So what we've heard from customers is that we need a way to do more than just database-centric uh, operations. Data is great. Data drives everything. But what we really want to do is point-in-time data. How is the data changed? How is it shaped? How is it modified? We also need better asynchronous processing. Um, for instance, there's gaps in outbound messaging with uh, how it's delivered, out of order delivery. The streaming API, while we've made improvements, is not a data synchronization tool for the complete set. Apex Future has many limitations around what you can do, how often they're running, et cetera. And finally, integrations need to be bi-directional. You need to get data in and out of the system, and you need to get events in and out of the system. At the end of the day, there's no real mus message bus on the App Cloud, which makes it, makes it difficult. So we've kind of started to shift into this idea of event-driven architecture. How do we begin to build logic against the App Cloud that is based on data events and data changing as opposed to just records being pushed into the system and synced out of the system? So now when I, I'm talking about events, we're really talking about a defined first-class data object inside of Salesforce. So we've gone ahead and introduced a new type of object called event. It has a nice underscore, underscore E instead of the underscore, underscore C suffix. So it's an event, not a custom object. And they have certain uh, pieces to them that, that make them event-like. Uh, they, they have a monotonic increasing replay ID. So when you create one event, you'll get a number. The next event you get will have a greater number than that. So you can start to uh, guarantee delivery and, and order your, your messages through our replay event. Now, these are strongly typed and canonical. So this is great with, uh, if you're used to building a custom object on Salesforce and used to versioning it, pushing out changes, upgrading it, we get that exact same feature set using uh, platform events because we've built it on the same UD structure. We give you the ability to publish these events because if you can't create them, it doesn't really help you. So you can create them either through our standard REST API, SOAP API, Bulk API, or we have a new Apex call that will specifically allow you to create the event. And finally, after you publish it, you need to subscribe to it. Now, that's subscription both externally, so you can stream the data out to your system, or subscription internally. If something comes in, if an event comes in from your system, you want to take action on it. So you want to subscribe to it through Apex triggers or potentially the process builder. So that's the event. But what, what, what we got to do with the event is put it onto a pipe. The, the event message bus. So the way we've built the message bus is essentially a time-ordered window. When you create a new event, it goes onto the tip. And as more events come out and time moves on, it moves slowly throughout the queue. 
until eventually it will fall off the back end and it will be removed. So that's a sliding time window. Right now we're playing with the time window of 24 hours. We're looking to get feedback on, is that long enough? Is it too short? Is it just right? So as you're playing with it, definitely keep us in, in mind. Now, because these, of, of those replay IDs, we can support different replays from different consumers. So as you see here, consumer A is subscribing from a very early event. Consumer B can subscribe from a later event. It's really up to the client side to determine what was the last event you saw, and do you want the next events out of it. Like I said, events are added through the Publish API. This can either be creating the event, just like you'd create a custom record through the bulk REST SOAP API, or it can be through that Apex uh, event, .pub, event bus publish. Finally, they're received through the subscription API. Pretty straightforward. You send us an event, we'll spit the event out to something that's listening to it. So the publishing API really gives you this ability to both publish on and off the platform. Now, you can also create the event through Process Builder and Flows. This is accessible just like any other S object. So you can, uh, for the, our low and no code developer spectrum, we can definitely start to plug in through the standard Process Builder and really the point and click development. You don't have to be a developer to actually use events. Same with the subscription API. You can uh, subscribe off platform through our existing uh, API, it's the exact same API that we use with the streaming API. Or you can subscribe to it through Apex triggers. Or you can subscribe to it through uh, Process Builder. You can actually start a process from an event subscription or event emission. So I went very fast. And the reason is I wanted to make sure we had plenty of time for the demo. And Lawrence is, has, has a great setup here. So I'm going to turn it over. He's going to give us the demo of platform events. All right, so when we were designing the App Cloud event bus, we wanted to avoid having to introduce a lot of new concepts, new programming concepts, or new features and APIs that you would have to learn. Now, if there are any Java developers here, you're probably familiar with that if you um, talk to a message bus in that ecosystem, you would use the JMS API. To talk to a database, you'd use the JDBC API. Um, in the Ruby world, you'd have active messaging, active record, and so on. And there are very good reasons why they do it that way. But at Salesforce, we control both the horizontal and the vertical. So we can kind of simplify that model. And the way we've done that is to take an object-centric approach. And we've made um, what would be a topic in, in a traditional message broker. Um, the, in our case, your event object, which is just a special class of custom object, is your topic. The records that you insert or publish are the messages that you publish on that topic. And then you can have a number of subscribers. So like any other custom object, you'll see that there are um, a lot of similarities. This is basically the same screen. Um, one of the differences, though, is that you have an underscore, underscore E suffix, as opposed to the underscore, underscore C for custom, or underscore, underscore X for external objects. You have a set of standard fields that come with uh, every record. And then you can add new custom fields. Right now, we support data types, like text and numbers. Um, you can also have uh, dates, date times, check boxes, and so on. Um, and we're looking into supporting lookups in the future. Um, for, there are two use cases where you would uh, reference another object. In one case, you don't really care if it's still there anymore. Um, it's just you know, maybe it's something happened, and you want to capture that ID. And if it gets updated or deleted, it doesn't matter. Um, and you can, you can use a text field just to funnel that ID along uh, just as well. But in the other case, you want to capture a record as it was uh, with like a deep copy at a snapshot and a point in time. So we're evaluating internally how we might implement that. And it would require making a new field type, um, but safe harbor and all that. So one of the other differences you'll see is the replay ID. Um, so like uh, Jay mentioned, this is the key for your message. It is monotonically increasing. This is a number. You know, standard Salesforce IDs look like this. Um, at the top, you'll see uh, there's a key prefix, and then 13 or 12 to 15 digits or alphanumeric characters after it. Um, but for the message, your replay ID is a number. Uh, and every time you publish, you'll get another uh, higher number um, on that topic. And so you're guaranteed that any later message will always have a higher replay ID than the one before. 
Um, another difference between this and custom objects is that this is write only. You can't use SOCL. You can't read it in any way. There's no visual components, so you won't see layouts on here. Um, so how do you read them? Well, you do that through our other APIs. And so one of the APIs that we support is the streaming API. Um, if you're familiar with the streaming API um, for push topics or generic messaging, uh, you're, you'll be right at home here. It's exactly the same. Um, this example, we um, have, we're using a third party library called Comet D that's running inside the page. So all the subscription is running entirely client side. Um, we set a channel. Now, um, if you're familiar with push topics, uh, the channel for the streaming API um, it would be like slash topic slash in the name of the push topic. In our case, it's slash event, that's the namespace, and then the API name or your topic for the event object. Um, then you supply uh, replay from optionally, um, where you say where you want to start the subscription from. And that can be a replay ID of a message you've seen before. And then you provide some kind of um, lambda that says what you want to do when you subscribe. So you don't always know a specific replay ID that you want to subscribe from. So we supply two magic values. Um, this is basically borrowed from Kafka. Um, the negative one indicates that you want to subscribe from the tip. Um, the tip just means that you want to get all the new messages that come in. So I'm going to publish a message. And we're going to publish, we're going to publish a customer order event for 12 spectacular sprockets. And then when that happens, let's see that we get that new event. Um, it doesn't have to be a, a browser. You can have mobile apps. Here I have a Ruby app. Um, and that's also subscribing on this event object. And so all of these uh, external subscribers are listening. Um, this is how you would drive behavior off platform from something that you publish, uh, from an event object that you publish. Now, one of the other alternatives um, that you can do is the negative two. And this tells uh, us that you want to get everything that we retain. When you say negative two, we'll power up our Eye of Harmony, send our TARDISes back in time, and scoop up every event that you sent in the last day. Um, that's our current retention period. We may offer options to extend that in the future. And then we will continue to send new events that occur in the future as they come in. And then, of course, you can specify a specific replay ID. And then we'll give you everything that happened after that. And the use case here would be you've got an external subscriber, and it might go down. You know, it's, um, it could crash, or you might take it down intentionally to upgrade it. When you bring it back, if you are persisting in, you know, locally in some local storage, uh, the last ID, the last replay ID from the last event that you successfully processed, you pass that to us. We replay from that. Here you'll see we passed in 569. So we'll give you the one event that happened after that. And then we will continue to give you new events as they come in. So that's how external subscribers would get notifications about um, event objects that were published. Um, if you want to drive behavior on the Salesforce platform, you would do that through uh, triggers. So this is a trigger that, I mean, you're probably familiar with the screen. This is basically the same thing as a custom object. This example trigger creates an opportunity, and then it persists that. Um, seeing as how we have already just published an event, we should see an opportunity show up here. And here it is. But let's say that we want to add additional behavior. One of the nice things about that, is, about this, is um, we can add new behavior to the system without having to impact any of the old behavior that we already have. So we're going to be friendlier now. Now, when we um, publish something, we're going to also say "Hello, Dreamforce." So we'll do that and say a new event came in. So it created a new opportunity. And then in addition, we have Hello Dreamforce in our logs. So triggers aren't the only mechanism that we want to 
um, used to drive behavior on the platform. Um, going forward, we'll add uh, support for event objects to other Salesforce features. Um, one of the ones that we're experimenting with right now is uh, Process Builder. Um, and in this example, um, this isn't active, but if it had been, it would have matched a customer order with an account on its customer ID. And then based on the number of units on the message, we'd either post something to Chatter or um, do, some other, do something else. In this case, I guess it would have created an opportunity. So let's see this. Um, I'll just review this end to end. This is an application that's running in Heroku, platform events at herokuapp.com. I'm going to create, oops, all right. I'm going to create some messages. What that'll do is it'll, um, it'll execute the customer order event trigger. The customer order event trigger will create some new opportunities. The opportunities had triggers on them. And in these cases, we're publishing an order response event. So this event is being generated on the platform. And then we'll publish that back out to, um, to our page. Now this left-hand side, this left-hand form, is basically just using uh, the REST API. The uh, source code for this is all in GitHub, github slash, github.com slash jthurst01 slash platform dash events dash socket IO. Um, and the code for that left hand form uh, just uses the enforce library to do a REST API call. So all we did was REST over here in the left, and on the right, we were uh, using the streaming API to listen. The opportunity, the trigger and the opportunity object that we had, uh, if I can find it again, um, it copied over the IDs of the opportunities that it created in here. And that's how we uh, drive behavior both um, on and off platform using the same uh, event objects. Um, this feature allows us to eliminate error prone uh, cron jobs where you go out and pull our system for uh, data changes. Um, it allows you to gain some durability through the use of the replay ID so that your processes can go down and come back up and not miss anything. And if you want to create your own events, you could go to bit.ly.com slash df16 events, um, publish something yourself, and see it flow in here. And I think Jay has a few more things to say. Yeah, so as you guys, if you want to hit that URL, you can all start pushing events in here. What we'll see is we'll see them start to stream out. So again, what we've done, just to highlight, we have a Heroku application that will push an event, publish an event onto the Salesforce message bus. That message is actually subscribed on Salesforce. It's doing logic. It's doing aggregation, creating a new opportunity, which then creates a, a second event type, which this app is streamed to. So, we're just showing it on the page. We're putting up a new tile every time a new event comes in. However, you could take any logic you want. This, is now, this event now is on the, the Heroku side of the app cloud. So you could begin to build an external app. You can link out the, the elastic scale that Heroku provides uh, into your system. Thank you. So what, what does the roadmap look like for platform events? Well, we're in beta, as I mentioned, right now. Uh, if you are interested in testing this functionality, please feel free to contact your account representative. They'll log a request with me, and I'll, we can get you enabled. With the platform event definition itself, we're also uh, baiting the Apex subscriber and the external publish and subscription pieces. The, Demo or the, what Lauren showed on the process builder isn't quite ready. We're still working on it. So that should come out over the next couple releases. In the spring release, I'm targeting to actually GA the events pieces and shift into working on high volume events. So we are currently backing everything on our Oracle tables. So there will be a limit to how scalable we can get. We're, we're playing around with the numbers, finding out what the right averages are, but it will probably be. Uh, two to 500,000 events per day with the, with the ability to purchase more if you need. 
high volume events will be actually Kafka backed, and this will be extreme high scale. So hundreds of millions of events going to a, a much broader topic and distribution cha channel. Going forward, taking high volume platform events, beta and ultimately GA, and starting to look at alternate messaging protocols. So we do use the Bayou protocol and the Comet D library, as, as Lauren showed, but uh, we have heard from a lot of customers it would be great if we had an actual messaging protocol, AMQP, HTTP, or uh, MQTT, or Stomp, one of those. So we will be exploring how, how, uh, what other protocols we can support. So what did we learn? Hopefully we learned a few things. First, what is event-driven architecture? How are we looking at it? And what are we trying to solve on the Salesforce platform? We showed you the definition of a platform event, what that looks like. We gave you a little bit of an in introduction to what these events are, the demonstration that Lawrence did, and then a little bit of a discussion on publishers and subscribers. So with that, a very, very easy to understand demo, I hope. I hope it made sense. But we do have uh, a few minutes for Q&A. We have a couple of microphones if you guys want to jump up and ask any questions. If not, thank you for coming. And definitely enjoy the rest of your Dreamforce. <laughs>